Alex. Hello, Seven. What, why music? Um, wow. Well, there's a there's there's a very logistical reason. Um, music is something that does not require much intention, much planning, and even much collaboration. Or organization, and um, <clears throat> I actually wanted to be a filmmaker. Mostly, I was just telling you the story. I came home and I was like, "Hey, mom, have you ever heard of Charlie Chaplin?" Mm -hmm. So after that, she put me in these like little after-school programs for film and whatnot. And um, but there's something about music where the path from ideation to expression from the moment of inspiration to the the place of being a witness to your own product um, is absolutely immediate I mean it happens while you're writing a song you become the audience um, I've experienced writing songs and not even knowing where they're coming from I've woken up from dreams having a song written for me in my dream mm. um, there's this sense of like a real sense of being a vessel where you're just the literal instrument through which music is speaking whereas other things film and and, um, and even writing on a certain level due to the, the process of editing um, and the length of time it takes to really produce a great piece of writing that feels far more mediated by considerations of your audience or um, considerations that would molest the process necessarily to, to see it through um, Whereas with music, there's a certain kind of mindlessness to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think that's unique to people like yourself? Because, I mean, to kind of take the writing examples, the, like the short stories of Franz Kafka spring to mind, and you can imagine you know, them being written like in a flurry. And what, I think what you're describing is what people call them the muse. Um, so, I mean, it's interesting how I think the, the muse could apply to different forms of creative expression I think it can I mean it it, 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 it has for me you know uh, but it depends like so yeah I mean it certainly can you know the, the stories go that uh, I was telling you why I wanted to drop out of school because I was reading Kerouac and they were like you know write something in the style of Kerouac so I did and I wrote something in a flurry without any um punctuation because I was so inspired by his lack of punctuation and I got a D and blah 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 but I did there, there are those moments where you can write those things in a, in a flurry um, my entree into philosophy was a wild uh, uh, two months where I was so gacked up on coffee I had just become sober um, so I was now like sober mm. drinking you know, pots of espresso before bed and I would do that sort of thing where I'd fall asleep for two hours and wake up and, um, you know, the, the, the Benjamin Franklin routine and, and the whole time I was like, I felt like I was stumbling on this thing I was thinking of called like magnetic zeros and all of these and I was writing this novel about this guy named Edward Sharp and he's discovered these magnetic zeros and he was able to see space and space looked like these strings and this is in 2003 and I hadn't heard about string theory yet and then I found out about string theory because I was telling someone about my novel and they're like, you gotta check out string theory so I picked up Lee Smolin's Three Roads to Quantum Gravity I just went into the shop, walked and then just, I was like, I'm gonna let the muse lead me 
picked the first book literally without, I, I knew that I was in the science section, but that's it. Opened the book up, it was called Three Roads to Quantum Gravity, and it said, The Sound of Space is a String. And it looked, it was a diagram, looked just like the ones I had written. Mm. So these things, these things happened, those sort of like unmediated moments where you just like throw forth. But in the case of music, it's almost always that. It, it's almost like that's the rule, not the exception. It's just always that way. Um, the only time it's not that way is when I pass the work off to my assistant engineer and I'm like, hey, can you fix the timing on these things, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so there is grunt work, but in, for the most part, it's, um, it's a sort of grunt work. I guess this is, this is the difference. The grunt work in music itself is still so highly creative. Um, kind of like editing in writing, mm. but it's so highly creative. Um, because what you're doing, it's like, I've never had the feeling of c celestial archaeology is what I try and describe it as, or, mm. or maybe like a celestial paleontology, mm. where you're discovering these bones uh, and you find a, a verse, right? And you're like, oh, that's a nice verse. Mm. I wonder what this goes with. And then you find this chorus. And you're like, mm, does this fit? And you're like, no, that's not quite, that's not quite what this bone belongs to. Mm. And you start building this animal and it's this incredible process of discovery rather than creation. Mm. And, um, and it's always that way. It's a process of discovery. You find something and then you've, the point isn't to like create what that belongs with, it's to find what that belongs with. Mm. And I find that in music, that process of like constant discovery is more present than, for instance, I'm writing a novel and I definitely with the novel, it's like, oh, that's my voice. Mm. This is my story that I'm writing. Mm. This isn't a story I discovered and just exists as this perfect form. There's too many twists, twists and knots and, and idiosyncrasies for it to be sort of the blueprint. But in a song, you can literally find the blueprint of this sort of heavenly body or this platonic form. It's, it's a process of sort of immaculate discovery. Mm. I think you're right. My like, kind of limited knowledge of like, modern music creation the mix and the mastering of a track can really change the texture of the thing possibly in a very unique way um, the, the thing you raised there about the, the string theory stuff is quite, quite interesting um, almost sounds like a moment of synchronicity, I had a very similar experience when I was doing my um, recent study of the um, original sceptics, so the Feronian sceptics, and I found that I had this word for um, the belief that um, sorry the assertion philosophically that you know the truth either exists or it doesn't which are you know two sides of the same coin but they're equally philosophical assertions and I was like okay they're going to be the dogmatists I grouped them together and I found out that um, the original skeptics had the same word for them mm. and I found that really quite creepy but yes. also uh, it, was, it came out of time when that when the book was quite esoteric and I was like this isn't going to fit together this doesn't make any sense but then it's kind of nice to have that sort of affirmation from thousands of years. Exactly. Ago. Yeah, latent affirmations. Exactly. I love that. Yeah. I, I think you're right. Because we, we, we tap in and that's how we know we're on the right path, I think. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, yeah, I love when that happens. It's, it's, um, it's cool. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. This happens in music more than anything else for me. But where you either write something or record something and suddenly you don't recognize your participation in it. Mm. It's, it suddenly seems like, okay, yeah, you discovered the animal, but it is its own animal. Mm. Somehow you are now in awe of whatever process led to this outcome. Mm -hmm. And in music, that happens for me. In, in other things, I can, I can be wowed by a synchronicity. Um, but 
when I look at the the end result or the the results of the fruits of my labor, even with those synchronicities in tow, I don't tend to have this experience that I almost don't even recognize my participation in it. Mm. Um, and maybe it has something to do with music, with the the the, the literal dealing with frequencies. Mm. You know, just literally dealing with these frequencies that really may belong together in various uh, organizations, you know, in somewhere. You know, it's like, oh, these really do belong together. These were meant to be. You, you end up getting that feeling a lot of the time. And a lot of the time when you're writing a song with a really good songwriter, um, there's an implicit understanding that you're not, you're not doing what you want to do, you're doing what the song wants to do. Sure. You start off, you find something, and then as soon as you find something, it's all about finding out what that something desires, not what you desire for it. Yeah. Yeah. That's sort of the experiential side to the muse, I think, what people call the muse. Yeah. But I, I think it's, you could maybe, um, instead of, you know, instead of Grecoizing it, you could kind of um, say that, that that creative process where the, the process is not something that you're a, part of or that you know it's not a um, case of labor and production but it's something that's happening through yourself and I, I think that's what people call a flow state yeah um, and I think I've experienced something like that in writing and it's very very strange because you know by all accounts you know I've spent hours and hours sitting down writing and editing and I know like you know in that in that moment in certain moments you know you lose you lose all track of time and that and that moment sort of glimmers out to you it's, it's almost it's, it's very similar to, um, and this is what I think groups them together, you know, the creative process and music, the creative process and writing, but I also think it applies to um, social experiences. You know, when you're, you know, having a really good time with your family and you lose track of time. Yeah. I think, I think this, there's, and you, I think, I would group them all together in meaningful experience. 100%. And, and the, you know, the, 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 I've read some studies on, you know, just what's happening with the brain when this happens like they've studied uh, people in Christian church doing glossolia and um, I think it's called shuckling or something like that in, 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 in temple when uh, you're praying and you're sort of you know Jewish sort of like mm -hmm. doing this activity yeah. but it's the, and, and same with you know the mantra um, and, and the various things but the parietal lobe shuts down, rock climbers, the zone, wherever you end up ex like seeing that zone, this, this, the, the area of the brain that is in control of our sense of space and time, especially time, and time is a very interesting subject, obviously, but um, sort of shuts down. And we lose, we don't even, we, we don't merely lose track of our time we lose track of ourselves in a weird way mm -hmm. you know and you brought up the thing of family which is an interesting one like that togetherness the identity sort of almost you lose the definition of a singular identity and gain the definition of a larger self um, and of course you know those are the moments that we all live for and I think they're very important Moments and and yeah, I gotta say, there's there's uh, I, I get into a lot of arguments with people, especially Europeans, uh, philosophers, Me too. Uh, yeah, about bec because they denigrate the ecstatic experience as this cheap thrill that couldn't possibly be isomorphic or tantamount to a true ritualistic experience, right? But the thing is that in order to hold that position you have to discard phenomenology mm -hmm. you have to discard psychology and you have to reduce everything to a behavioralism yes and that is not like the proper grounds on which to conduct any philosophical thought you can't reduce psychology to behavior yeah. so we find our ways whether it's a fucking Britney Spears concert, whatever it is, we find our way to experience this flow state. 
Um, and and you know, and it, and it's very interesting. It takes a lot of permutations and a lot of different um, forms that the flow state takes. It takes this creative form, the muses, the vessel that we're talking about. Um, but in a lot of ways, it's not dissimilar to the flow state that someone in an audience may get when they lose themselves in an experiential sea. Mm. You know, so um, yeah, and it's a great area of study for sure. I think the European mind is scarred by the loss of loss of its certainty, mm. and I think mm. that lots of European peoples are sort of looking for a way to reliably replicate those sorts of experiences perhaps mm. and you know they look at the um, you know coincidence of you know today just happened to be a really nice day you know everyone just happened to be at someone's house and you know you all enter that flow state but it's like well we can't do that every day and I think the European mind wants to sort of regimentalize things and I, th I think that's I don't think that's um, a necessarily bad impulse um, but I, th I think that it's clear that the flow state and meaningful experiences actually does have a dark side. Oh it's, yeah, it's it, you know someone at a um, a political rally. Oh yeah, could feel very like when they're part of the mob, for example. Oh yeah, could feel like they're doing the most meaningful and most righteous thing. Oh yeah, I mean you know it's also you know the flow state of you know like going to a KKK rally and burning things and. Chanting hateful th cries. Just you know. experience. No, but, <laughs> but still, like, like you have to remember that, like, for instance, that someone the other day was like, "What about belonging, though? Like, belonging in spiritual? Like, I get that you're deconstructing the spiritual experience and New Ageism and whatnot, and we're taking a look at ourselves, but belonging is so important." I was like, "Yeah, belonging is." important um, most belonging is established through creating out groups though mm -hmm. and um, you can feel an amazing sense of belonging by being a Nazi or a member of the KKK or whatever the case um, so belonging in and of itself it's kind of like I was just re starting to read through your book it's like these the, the, the fundamental, like the virtue as the virtue, the fundamental reduction of virtue to the uh, thing in itself, essentially, the, the belonging. Mm -hmm. Belonging is good. Well, we all need belonging. Um, we all seem to need it. Um, and, for instance, you brought up like the European mind and one sort of structure and whatnot. Um, my natural inclinations just because of who I am is like fuck that you don't need that but in learning there's a great maybe not great but a pretty interesting experiment done that is very controversial but it was replicated in various ways uh, I think it was in like 2016 during like the rise of Trump a professor at Yale conducted one and they con conducted one at USC and the Yale one was really interesting. Basically, and, and at USC, they were like studying the brains of conservatives and liberals mm. to try and figure out if there's a difference. <laughs> kind of like the new racism, right? Sure. It's like, what's the skull size? Like, what's creating the difference oh. here? And, um, and let's see if I can not blow this. Well, I can't remember exactly the regions of the brain at the moment. Uh, there was more... Uh, I don't want to blow the regions of the brain. But basically, there was more of the fight, flight, and freeze uh, activity mm -hmm. in the conservative yeah. uh, and more of the uh, pref prefrontal cortex or whatever the decision-making, the, the ability to uh, pattern, pattern identification in the liberal. And, um, and so taking that idea, this guy at Yale was like, okay, what if I could turn then a conservative into a liberal temporarily? Mm -hmm by conducting these sort of like safety uh, mindfulness exercises. Yeah. So you give them a set of questions, they fill them out, conservative. Do this exercise where they feel this immense sort of like womb-like safety, mm -hmm. give them another set of questions, they turned temporarily liberal. And he did this experiment and he was able through making people feel safe to make people more sort of liberally inclined and, and less sort of like build a wall around me yeah, yeah. you know and suddenly I was realized well wow the most like progressive uh, 
political move then would maybe to like go ahead and build a wall yeah. like let's make these conservatives feel safe because if we can make people feel safe they might be more inclined to uh, explore there was another little thing where it's like they had these kids in a playground and there was no fence around the playground so the kids just stayed around the playground but then they put up a fence like way around the perimeter of the playground and so the kids started exploring the area mm-hmm. so my ch- my feelings on safety and and all of that have changed where I understand the the use of conservative values actually to produce uh, I don't like the word progressive so much but moves uh, adventuresomeness mm-hmm. you know yeah 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 I mean the literature is quite clear on the fact that conservatives tend to have a higher disgust sensitivity so they're more easily like, like you say, the flight or flight of the... I believe it's the hypothalamus is the part, is the kind of lizard part of the brain yeah. that gives you that sort of yeah. um, visceral response to things. Um, but the, interest, the, the example of the children is quite interesting because you, I think you need both sides in tension with each other in a dialectic because the conditions that the conservatives is protecting prote- allows the... Um, Exploration. Liberal to yeah. explore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in safety, you know? I know, I know. It's funny, and if we could just, if we could just grok that together, yeah. Yeah. it would be it would be transformative. Yeah. But it's in, it's interesting because, you know, we had the scientific racism of the 20th century, and like you said yourself, like there's a new neuroscience which is potentially going to be going that way. Although it will be called something different, so it won't be the same thing. Although we're still using objective medical science right. to engineer people. Yeah, um, and I think I think the idea of utopia is a very is incredibly dangerous one because you know if certain impetuses in the academies have their way and they're able to um, chemically or psychologically engineer conservatives to act more liberal, but then <laughs> you've got the um, you've got the free play of the liberal side of society, but then all the systems are going to collapse because there's no one to. No one to, plan to to make sure the trains are running on time. You know, it's interesting. I wonder the extent to which this what I'm about to say is true or not. But I I I've, I've been acting like it's true and writing like it's true, and it's um, the subject of some of my substacks. But like I, I I do think that I think utopia is so far sort of this red herring that we use to apply or really to explain or apologize for our com- oppression compulsions mm. um, and our uh, and, and our oppression compulsion really is, is a desire for struggle clusters to belong to a struggle cluster again like coming back to this issue of belonging the, the, the most serious memberships on the face of the earth are those memberships which have identified um, themselves as either victims or as having a uh, existential threat from a larger outgroup? Yeah. And um, you know, and and obviously uh, Jewish people and uh, Black Americans come to mind as easily. I think the two most um, strong identities that, is, that are associated with sort of struggle clusters. Mm. Ironically too, um, like black America for, from the perspective of white America has become the, the club to which everyone would love to be able to belong. Mm. Um, and because we can't belong I mean some people get invited to the barbecue as they say on social media like oh he's invited to the barbecue which means like he's got a hall pass you know to the the world of uh, black America Mm -hmm. Um, but because largely and and of course there's this secret password to get into the party that only the real members can say Mm -hmm. is the n-word and but because we can't belong so you see white America creating these manufacturing these other struggle clusters um, and I won't even name them because it's such a hot button issue but I can name ones that are sort of easy to name like oh I can't wear a mask 
oh, I'm oppressed, like, I, I, I mean, sorry, I have to wear a mask, now I'm oppressed, or what, whatever, we'll take whatever we can get, mm. because any struggle I can manufacture, oh, I'm a white man, I'm oppressed now, mm. I, could, I could do that, now, I was like, sudden, this is my time, right, yeah. this is my one opportunity to be an oppressed group, yeah. like, woke, has delivered me the goods. I can seize this moment and become a Jordan Peterson and fucking have purpose and meaning now. Yeah. We all really secretly want to belong to these struggle clusters. And, um, and so the idea of the utopia, I think, I don't know if that would ever occur because when I think of the progressive mentality, I think of a mentality that once utopia arrives, like let's say we solve all problems, we would simply invent new ones because we must, because we can't live without somehow instigating a heroic cycle. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That last point there was really interesting because that's it's a reason why I find the idea of um, heaven quite bewildering. And heaven is analogous in the human mind, I believe, to ut the idea of utopia, earth utopia. Yeah, heaven on earth. Heavenly. Yeah, yeah, right. I, I think that the human animal would be like bored to death if he was in paradise. I don't to, think to that the would extent, be exactly. To the extent where, <laughs> to extent where, to the extent where the king of paradise could say, "All right, we can stay here in this paradise forever. Whatever you do, just don't eat the apple from that tree," and he right. would still do it. Right. Of course. Yeah, and that I think that is almost the eternal story of of man. I think so, and I, and I, you know, we used to have, I, I divided struggles into, uh, what was it, it was like, um, something along the lines of like, um, extant struggle, mm. and then um, maybe like reactive struggle or something, but you have extant struggles, right, like you're born into a world of uh, impoverishment mediated by some king and some empire and you're just born into oppression mm -hmm. that's an extant struggle yeah. but then you end up in a situation where you have relative equilibrium mm -hmm. and you don't have any extant struggles so you have to fucking manufacture something right, right. I remember growing up in, in like upper middle class white like kid in the valley in Los Angeles surrounded by you know real culture but none of it was mine it was like Mexicans yeah, yeah. Um, uh, black folk um, I ran track and field so I was like taken in by these kids that were mostly from you know the quote unquote inner city and it was amazing I remember just abandoning all my white friends like my little private school friends mm -hmm. uh, on my birthday and only hanging out with these kids because they had this like language and this way of communicating uh, that was like real and I remember thinking in it I'd be a kid and I'd be like I'd be like 10 and I'd want to squint and go like this <laughs> like I worked a really hard day mm -hmm. because I wanted to imagine what it would be like to really live I kept having that phrase in my mind I want to really live yeah, yeah. I want to feel struggle something yeah. and so the only thing I could come up with eventually was okay I'll become a drug addict yeah. That's a good one, right? Immediate, oh, pr oh, I'm a drug addict, oh no. Like, it was this uh, perfect, um, and really my only option to, 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 to create sort of a heroic arc for myself. And I think that we all sort of have that on some level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Except for some of these really weird, well-adjusted people who don't. I don't know. <laughs> I was, was going to draw a parallel, because I think the the British middle class is in a similar situation. Mm. Like, the extent of their culture is, you know, identifying with what supermarket they go to. Right. Which is hilarious because um, the class system is still there in the UK. It's just, it's, it's more of a social dance than a physical, you can't go here barrier sort of thing. And it's, so it's funny because people do um, judge, the, judge their own success based on what supermarket they're able to shop at. But the wow. lower okay. classes and the upper classes, they still have the cult, they still have a culture. Um, and it's, I, I think I just want to go back to the European mind again because and this is a very specific example but maybe it applies here is that the European mind but specifically Christianity is very good at punching up it's very good when it's ontologically oppressed and a good example of that is Christianity Christianity is a very um, it's very strong ideologically and um, spiritually 
when it's the religion of the minority, when it's punching upwards, when it's against the Roman oppressors, when it's sure. etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I think it's had a real the the reason why it pulled itself apart. Yeah, and I think we're still feeling the hangover of that is because it it ontologically has to be yeah. It has oh, to be asymmetrical. It, it can't I, be dominant. I think you see it in the um, the adoption, especially of Protestant denominations, the adoption of um, progressive, um, like oppressed I- ideologies, basically. In the uh, like within the like the pro- proliferation of the de- like various denominations, you mean, or? or like progressive I, I mean specifically in the adoption of oppressed classes as the, oh, cause, sure, the sure. cause of the Christianity. Sure. Uh, I mean, you, your example of um, self-sabotage in people's own lives is a, is a good example of people creating oppression. I think the, um, the oppressed classes of the rainbow flag are a very similar thing where these things are created. Yeah, I mean, we didn't have, you know... It's just a, it's we're we're living through a, a really great example of um, I think you know a it's a hybrid. It's not a fully manufactured uh, oppression. Right. Well, yeah. You'd be silly to pretend that um, the Catholic Church wasn't a place to harbor homosexuals in the past. Right. For example. Right. 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 Exactly. And there's and there's all that sort of hypocrisy and the the you know the like the queer movement or the you know the many lettered movement i think is is a good example of um, the use of extreme force that was actually asymmetrical force um, there wasn't really opposition in particular to the trans movement mm-hmm. there wasn't an existing extant opposition mm-hmm. to the trans movement there simply wasn't there were there, there were here and there there was a smattering of like you know oh I think that people are you know there's bigotry and it probably exists and whatnot. but there wasn't like anti-trans legislation there mm-hmm. wasn't like a massive anti-trans movement because there wasn't a massive trans movement yeah. uh-huh. so these things like are co-created you know but in this case it's very clear to me that the the sort of gay rights movement had more or less achieved a kind of equilibrium not fully, like some states were still treating uh, 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 homosexuality as literally punishable by death, I think in Mississippi and sodomy is still like totally illegal and all these sorts of things. But So there's still work to be done. Um, but it had reached a certain threshold beyond which like really being enraged and being like, you know... Fight the power that had that energy had dissipated mm. to to an extent. So it was like, okay, well, what's next? Mm. Well, this is next. Yeah. And the way that the this is next was handled in terms of the pronoun thing, like forcing other people to speak a new language, um, and being really incensed when you were being misgendered, mm. um, was a perfect way to incite a new cycle of struggle cluster yep. and belonging and all these things. And I say that as a total supporter of uh, the trans movement. Mm-hmm. Like, actually, I think trans is probably the most important and philosophically relevant social movement that I'll see in my lifetime. Yeah. I think it's, it's very close to my philosophical outlook, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But... It's also an example of uh, a, the instigation of a struggle cluster, mm-hmm. and um, and 
And you see, again, coming back to the, the, the mind of the conservative, the feeling of not having safety barriers, not knowing what's happening, feeling like you're in the middle of this missing axioms moment, if I understand it correctly, where suddenly it's like, wait a minute, like, it's a social construct? Like, what do you, like, everything is like, <gasps> and so of course you're going to get this visceral reaction from the conservative mind where it's like, now all of a sudden they're rolling back uh, uh, all the legislation and improvements that had occurred for uh, for gay rights, for mm-hmm. homosexual rights, and now suddenly, I was just reading a study. Like uh, people, the general sentiment in the U.S. has now um, reverted itself to like a more anti-gay stance right. in the wake of this fear uh, of ontological dissipation. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like I thought we had these categories set, and suddenly they're not set. And so you, you, know, you experience that fear. So ironically, again, it comes back to like, if we really want to move things forward in a progressive way, we kind of have to act like parents. Mm-hmm. Like, y- you want your kid to explore the outer realms, so put a little boundary around the, around the outer realms. Like, let's, you have to do this incrementally. But that's not, that also doesn't satisfy our desire to belong to a struggle cluster. Mm-hmm. So it's this conflict between the desire for a struggle cluster and, and, and the heroic arc and then the you know it's like we'd like that carrot almost to always be dangling just that utopia always needs to be just out of our reach mm-hmm. to propel us uh, forward to give us meaning mm-hmm. you know so it's a it's a total it's a perfectly it's a perfect operation really there's a million things in there I could comment on. I think we'd be here all day. I did want to talk specifically. You mentioned 2003 and you mentioned um, sobriety. So uh, that's obviously a personal thing. So you can get into that as much or as little as you want. But I am interested in your sort of discovery of philosophy. Like, did someone give you a book or did you... That's a great, uh, that's a great question. I was just... Fun- did you, you're newly sober. You've got all this energy. I've got to do something with it. Like, no, you know what it was? Uh, and I, I... Like, if I was like, what's your advice for musicians? It was like, what's your advice for young philosophers? You never get that question because right. there's not enough of them out there, uh-huh. right? But I think everyone kind of considers themselves secretly like a philosopher. At least if you look on Instagram, that's, that's the way it feels. Everyone thinks they're a life coach and has some really interesting thing to say. And I think that that's great. Um, my advice would be to this, do the same thing I did just because I think it's the most fun way to approach it. Uh, similar to maybe what you did, like you discovered that, uh, you know, that the, what was it, the skeptics, no, the skeptics? Yeah. Yeah, that the skeptics had, uh, whatever, you discovered your own sort of like synchronicity vis-a-vis not studying them initially, you obviously had some impulse and, and you followed it. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you gave yourself permission to be like, I can think for myself, I, I have good ideas, I don't just need to read in a book. And that's basically what I did is like, you know, I was inventing string theory and I had this idea about like how these, how space was formed and I was maddeningly writing it all which is still now central to my uh, philosophy and freak theory and stuff. And, um, and, and I've, it's been commented on me like, like, well, aren't you just like wasting your fucking time because mm. you could have easily you're reinventing the wheel here yeah. you know why don't you just go study and then you can make improvements on whatever you find out there but the thing is that that's not as fun mm-hmm. number one and number two there's a really good reason which is that we end up being molested by official information mm-hmm. Where we think, okay, that's that's what it is, and our creative aspects of our mind begin to shut down. I've experienced this a lot, and um, especially in spirituality. And like, don't know what that is, Jay. Or whatever that is. Um. So this is how you're supposed to act and suddenly it like it, it lessens my, my ability to sort of think creatively so 2000 to 2000 I, I got sober and I was in like sober living and blah 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 and I was it was this amazing time and um, 
I was really living, you know, like, I was like, oh, this is, this is it, you know, I was like in a house with 16 other derelicts, and we're all trying to get sober, and, and, um, and around that time, I started, like, just writing as if I was smart, sure. <laughs> like, I would look back, I, I just recently, fake it till you make it, right? yeah, fake it till you make it, I look back at some of these, I just found some of these things that I was writing back then, I started reading Kant, <laughs> out of the blue I don't know who or how I don't know where I got that it's a difficult place to tip, dip your toes in yeah but I really liked it and then I went right into sort of like Sartre existentialism sort of stuff and, um, yeah. and then I also uh, there was three books I can't remember what uh, what book of Kant's I was reading or what it was or maybe it was like an anthology I don't remember what it was uh, existentialism something, I think existentialism is in the, in the name, and then uh, 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 Civilization is Discontents by Freud. Yeah. And somehow those three, and I started writing, and I was like, started dressing differently, like I was like making up these new sort of, uh, I would take my collar and pin it up here, and I was in this like punk rock mode, and I was like bicycling to work every day at the studio, and thinking a lot, and writing, and thing is, I had nobody to talk to. All my friends were like these just musician guys. They didn't want to talk about, you know, anything like that. So it was just write. And um, I look back at some of that writing, and it's funny. It's like you think you've changed so much, mm -hmm. but you look back at your old writing, and you're like, I'm literally the same person, right. just with more access to various things now. Yeah. Um, but I was interested in the same things and I cared about the same things and, uh, and all of that and um, I don't know man it, it's like and then I got lost in the success of music and, and some of that was put on hold but you know what really got me back to philosophy was I made this big transition from being like a punk guy that I just described like purely sarcastic ironic never smiled on stage like I was totally afraid to smile on stage I was not cool uh, unless I was bleeding you know I had all these armors and then I was like okay I was becoming suicidal I was still sober but I was just like this is bad I need to re-embrace like the child I need to re-embrace it was like this Nietzschean mm -hmm. sort of like time to get back to the child sort of thing and um, and that's when this Edward Sharp thing began and I began embracing earnestness and it was this very scary thing but what happened was the critics, the gatekeepers of cool, were like, you can't do that. Yeah. You can't go from that punk rock thing to this earnest hippie thing mm -hmm. unless you're a faker. So you're a fraud. Mm -hmm. And it was vicious mm -hmm. and it was ubiquitous. Yeah. Every outlet was like, you can't trust this guy. He's trying to, like, he's just a grifter. Yeah. And I was so. I was hurt by that because it was like this was actually something I was going through. I had literally become suicidal. Like I was looking like actually suicidal, not just like, oh, I'm suicidal. Like I was like assessing every beam I saw to hold my capacity and weight and everything was like yeah. n any day now. And then this reversion to like a child state and this embrace of, of earnestness was very real. I was like, what is this? Like refusal of identity change yeah. like what 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 is what is that actually what what's the meat what's where's that coming from like what's the actual genesis of this and so i started writing a book on cool and status anxiety yeah. and through status anxiety i got back into sort of death drive and freud and all these sorts of things and just kept writing and then all of a sudden I was like off to the races thinking about all kinds of stuff and all of a sudden Magnetic Zeros came back as this, uh, this is the Hegelian thing, right? So it's like I didn't know who Hegel was, but I knew that there were these oscillations because I was staring at them all day. I'm staring at music waveforms all day. There are just these troughs and peaks, troughs and peaks, and then you compress them and you lift the valleys up to the peaks and then you end up with this uniform compression of formerly dynamic sound mm. that now is 
wait a minute, you zoom out from one of those compressions and it's literally isomorphic to a flat line. It's just a fatter mm. flat line. It's isomorphic to silence. How? Now, and I would be like, oh, I'm lamenting this loss of dynamism. This is terrible. Oh, no. But then I started to think, wait a minute. Humanity is constantly driving itself toward these equilibriums, mm. toward these saturation points. In fact, my own very life is constantly just a succession of reaching these equilibriums, these saturation points, these boredom points, mm. these hums, these, uh, like you described, uh, 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 um, you know, heaven being just this, it's too boring. Yeah. You have to do something. So there's new equilibriums occurring. And all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, this is very interesting. And I started writing freak theory. Then I start learning about Hegel and I start learning about Splatoon. I'm like, oh my God, this is the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Literally the exact same thing. The way he describes it in the science of logic is literally as a sinusoidal wave that collapses vis-a-vis -vis attraction. So you have repulsion and attraction, which is how a sinusoid, like how those waves occur. And they collapse because the attraction wins out, and when they collapse, they collapse into an indeterminacy, right? Which is isomorphic to any true infinity and or nothingness, right. the everythingness of nothing, and all of a sudden, I was like, this is the same thing. The and it was so beautiful. So I was like, ah, oh, this is so one of those synchronicity moments, and then it was so affirming mm -hmm. that... Um, yeah, and what was, that, even though he was this German professor, yeah. years ago, he was thinking the same way. He was thinking the same way. Yeah. And the cool thing is, what, what I was saying is like, uh, follow your own instincts before you educate yourself fully about all these things. At least that's just my, that was my path. Because when you end up finding out about those things, you'll actually have a unique vantage mm -hmm. into those operations. You'll have your own vantage into those operations. Um, you know, that is if the synchronicity occurs and it could not and you could be totally reinventing a really dull wheel yeah. but um, anyway you know you're not inventing a dull wheel when you're excited about it yeah I think what, what you said about people's reaction to your change in identity was very interesting because people would assume creative types in the music industry would be the most free flowing with the way they act socially the way they expect other people to be and it's right. quite funny how you know you're not the punk guy anymore so you should stay in your lane sort of thing or if you change now you weren't authentic in the first place exactly and it's because that ties in it's like well it does challenge what we were saying earlier about discuss sensitivity because I think there is a there's a new lockstep from people who consider themselves more liberally minded where they've, they've adopted that discuss sensitivity and they want people to stay in their lanes you know um, I, want, I wanted to bring up something you said about oh everyone on Instagram is like a philosopher like everyone's a mind co uh, life coach or whatever and I I've had a couple of conversations with people we know about uh, like philosophical elitism in tension with universalism um, someone like Cadell Last is more on the universalist side of things where he thinks that philosophy should be brought to everyone everyone should have the knowledge of philosophy and, <laughs> and, and then, I don't know what you were saying about everyone has their own uh, toes dipped in certain ways well this is, a, this is a perfect question right this is the question because like someone like Peter Lindbergh who runs the Stoa yeah. who I love he has this thing called the wisdom commons mm. and he wants wisdom to be common yeah. well then then we're talking about one of those saturation points again sure. where everything's just you, you see this in trends uh, this is how cool operates something is asymmetrical it's cool as soon as it becomes, it grows into a, a symmetry, like becomes the mainstream, it's lame. Yeah. So then there's a reversion, and then all of a sudden, how do you become cool? By being anti-wisdom, yeah. or by being, I remember in the 90s, it was really actually kind of lame to act smart. Yeah. Like it was like, I don't know, early 2000s, like everyone was like, I'm, d I'm dumb. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you still see this like, infant, like intentional infantilizing of the uh, of, of of the self, but now all of a sudden you see these kids on Instagram, mm. these what do they call them? Uh, fucking uh, politogram or no theorygram? Sure. It's like the theorygrammers. You see all these young kids posting really ornate shit. I don't know if they understand what they're posting, but they're really into Deleuze and 
uh, Foucault and they want to like you know and f- f- Lacan and they're posting all these things and, and, and all these other kids are commenting and it's actually really beautiful to see you see this sort of like rise of nerdcore yeah. and of course it's always going to probably have a, a limited space but I think it's it's also representative or reflective anyway of the more mainstream uh, you know life coach type I'm not even talking about life coach I don't even want to call these people they're sort of like self-appointed gurus yeah. of like very banal wisdom yeah. you know I, I think this is, this is my sort of opposition to the universalism is that I actually think that's a bad thing but I think the majority of people are not only incapable of doing actual philosophy but when they do it it's very bad like you know it will be an Instagram model who has a, a picture of her uh, showing off herself, but she's got a Sartre quote at the bottom. <laughs> that is like that is the I literally, of human existence. I there. literally broke up with someone because that was the vibe going sure. on. I was having such a hard time with it. I honestly think if Alan Turing could see the future, he would have broken the computer. Like, <laughs> he would have like, no, that's not the way we're going. Like, I think you're bringing up a really difficult and important and real point, and you know, it's it's it's. This is one of those crossroads in any conversation where you're like, do you want to be right or do you want to be happy? Yeah. Do you want to be right or do you want people to like you? Do you want to be right or do you want to belong? Do you want to be right or do you want to be an asshole? But in this case, there is good reason, especially with the rise of AI and, um, and the democratization of, of the tools of creativity, to remind ourselves if even just to keep an eye on ourselves as idiots, Mm. that we're not all natively brilliant. Mm. And maybe we are fundamentally brilliant, maybe. But we are, at the very least, usually so inculcated with the stupidity of traditional society or education, or whatever. Um, however it happened, a lot of us are dumb. Mm. <laughs> like, for instance, and, and by dumb I just mean not attuned to the, the very subtleties of existence which, if you're attuned to them, can allow you p- to produce human depth, mm. can allow you to produce... Um, and contribute in ways to society that um, that actually create more dynamic range, more interestingness, mm-hmm. you know? And um, a good example of this is that um, there is a phenomena on new televisions uh, called uh, the um, soap opera effect. And what it is, is on new televisions, they're usually designed for HD sports. And that means they're running at like a frame rate of, I don't know, let's just say 500 frames per second or something. The human eye can only see like somewhere near 300 frames per second. This is like more frames than we can even see. Mm -hmm. Film is shot on 24 frames per second. So when it shows film on the HD setting, it's interpolating like... 50 frames in between every frame, right? The effect is that you'll watch something like Lawrence of Arabia and the shot on 75 millimeter or 70 millimeter, beautiful, and it looks like they're in a 3D rendering of a soap opera. Most people either don't see the difference, can't tell, never occur to them that something is off, or when they are shown the difference prefer the soap opera effect yeah and you can see this when you go to youtube i encourage anyone to do this go to youtube look up the soap opera effect side by side comparison and then where they do a side by side comparison of the real thing versus the soap opera effect then look at the comments mm, three quarters of the comments are i like this soap opera effect now, meanwhile, you have directors and all these people like trying to coalesce to try, like Tom Cruise is even one of them, to try and bring attention and awareness to this and try and get TVs to automatically switch out of HD 
so that if it's a movie, you're watching it the way it was like with all the beautiful saturation and motion and everything like the way it's supposed to be. Meanwhile, the fans, they want it the bad way. They prefer it in this bad way. Now, we can get into relativism. Well, it's all relative. No, it's not actually. If you're going to hold your position, which is a, an elitist position, mm -hmm. then you can't ascribe to relativism. Now, you can say that the phenomenology or the, 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 the psychology of enjoyment is relative. And that may be true, right? Like one, for instance, one being in the zone at a Katy Perry concert mm -hmm. for someone you must admit that's probably isomorphic and identical, identical to someone being in the zone at a fucking, I don't even know, like a, 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 a Charlie Parker concert. They're the same psychological loss of time and space and, and identity and all of those things because one indeterminacy is identical to another. And that's something that uh, literally set theory proves. So, and yet the stupor, the drunken stupor of the drunk on your corner who's sitting right next to the, the monk who's likewise in a stupor that is isomorphic to the drunk guy mm -hmm. is nevertheless a different qualitative stupor. <laughs> There's something qualitatively different about the monk in his 10-hour meditative uh, trance mm. than there is the drunk in their 10-hour 10 10 hour medi meditated, medicated stupor. So, um, you know, and this comes back to, to, to Hegel in a way. There are these indeterminacies on the in interior, but they are different uh, and they represent themselves differently. Quantity is different than uh, essence, is different than, um, you know, than being, and um, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, it's, it's a difficult question, and I think being in defense, like defending elitism, um, what right now what I'm into is defending inefficiencies, because one thing that is flattening everything vis-a-vis -vis democratization. So it relates to elitism. When we have democratization of the tools of creation, um, there is a natural process of optimiz optimization that, that occurs part and parcel with that democratization. For instance, um, the tools of creation, um, as soon as you have, you're filming here with this very easy camera and this, uh, this little laptop computer and you have this thing you didn't learn, need to learn how to become a fucking engineer you just bought this thing you could purchase your 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 mastery and you press play you press record and here we are recording mm -hmm. well when you democratize those tools now everyone's a podcaster right and um, when you optimize the process of creation you uh, you you shave off all of the uh, inefficiencies, all of the deviations from the optimal state, but you also make it far easier for anyone to do. You need less know-how to do it. And because of that general process of democratization, optimization, optimization naturally democratizes those tools because you need less know-how and it becomes much, le much easier with le less effort, so more people engage in it. And then because you have more people engaging in it, what you end up with is sort of this averaging out vis-a-vis um, -vis mimesis. So you're doing it this way, now someone else is going to look at this. Shit, I want to do it. You're doing this, you're inspiring me, now I'm going to do it this way. <laughs> right? And we all start doing it, and all of a sudden everything is sort of the same. And I, I asked myself this with Edward Sharp. I was like, okay, I'm embracing love, I'm embracing earnestness. If this becomes popular, because this was 2006, this is before love and this is before Obama hope, this is before all of those bands that you know began selling Hondas with their like neo-hippie folk pop bullshit, I was sort of like beginning that. Oh. And I was like, if this becomes popular mm. and everyone begins to sort of be like embracing this thing, and the word I used was love, if love becomes mainstream. Yeah. I was just doing this as a psychic exercise for myself. Will I still be into love? Right. 
or will I recoil from it because I'm so obsessed with vanguardism, I'm so obsessed with asymmetry that I'll abandon it. And uh, I, aban I, I basically, ab <laughs> I felt like I had to abandon it because I suddenly was really, really what happens when you become, I was selling Hondas, yeah. even inadvertently, like and indirectly. And it also wasn't yours anymore. It wasn't mine anymore. Yeah. And um, so anyway, there is something to say for barred absolutes. There is something to say for membranes, membranics, for, if not elitism, for speciality. Mm. You know, keeping things, like, having barriers to entry. And, and in that way, I know you said the other day you hate gatekeeping. But on a level, if you don't have gatekeeping, you don't have initiation, if everything is easy, everything flattens. Yeah. So in what way can, can and, and then we talked about natural barriers to entry, like just simply the, the, the literal intellectual weight of something presents a natural barrier to entry where not everyone's going to engage. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's difficult. For instance, Hegel, if, if, the, if the ideas of Hegel and the way that I interpret them became really popular, like the idea of sublation was fully understood, and suddenly everyone on Instagram is like, ah, the, the thing, that, you know, the sublation, and the, well, I'm just going through like an equilibrium where it's like, you know, the oscillations of, uh, of uh, uh, repulsion and attraction have collapsed, I'm just going through this like indeterminate state. I'd, would, I, would I suddenly be like, ugh, like just have a gag reflex and be like, fuck all of this? I, I, mean, I mean, you already have that where people sim simplify Hegel to me. Oh, there's two parts of the dialectic of it, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, no, it's true. Yeah, yeah, and 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 so you, it, it's it's an interesting. And again, this comes back to my own desire to be asymmetrical, which is similar to the struggle cluster, um, and similar to the idea of like I'm I'm trying to promote these ideas. I'm talking about them here, but as soon as everybody understands them, I want nothing to do with them. Uh -huh. <laughs> what is that, yeah. right? So there's obviously like either a pathology, but certainly a compulsion there. There's so much to talk about, <laughs> but it's been it's been a, been really good to talk to you. Um, I have a sort of tongue-in-cheek question. I wrap up with with everyone, sort of a reminder not to take ourselves so seriously all the time, which probably tracks with what we've been speaking about today. Um, if you were on death row and you had a last meal, what would your last meal be? I'm getting like this, like ice cream salad with like a whipped cream. What's an ice cream salad? Well, in Cuba, you know, so uh, so it's a fun story. Is Cast that lettuce in it? No. Okay. <laughs> Castro came to the States when he was still on slightly good terms. He'd just taken Cuba over, and he came to the States, and he visited, and I think it was in, like, either in New York, or he went to Canada briefly, and he had this ice cream, and he was so blown away by the ice cream uh -huh. that he thought that if he could only bring this ice cream back to Cuba... The revolution would never end and everyone would understand the fruits of the revolution mm -hmm. and so he built this giant uh literally i've been there it it, it, it spans like two square blocks mm -hmm. this giant like ice cream palace um and the name of it is escaping me right now but i went and visited and one of the things you can get if you if you live in cuba if you're a cuban like resident mm -hmm. you can get the ice cream salad and the ice cream salad is like five different scoops. It costs nothing. It's like Viva la Revolución. And uh, if you're not from Cuba and you go there really excited, um, you get ushered and you're like, oh, you're not from Cuba? Okay, come here. And you see this beautiful palace and you're being ushered away from it into this tiny, basically like a closet, mm -hmm. just, just decrepit with a tiny askew television and, uh, and no light. And you get a choice from like four different ice creams, but you can't really have the salad. And you don't get some of the like mango and other flavors down there. You're, you don't have access. You get vanilla, chocolate, maybe strawberry. Sure. You get it in a, pla in a plate and then you get to eat it. And I'm like, can I bring it outside? Like walk around? They're like, no, you can't. You can't even enjoy this place um, if you're not from there, which I think is brilliant, right? Mm -hmm. It's like... You, if you're an American, you don't get to experience this. You have to be a fucking Cuban communist. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the ice cream salad is five different scoops on a plate. And so I'd imagine something like that with a giant thing of whipped cream and maybe a cherry. You know? Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Yeah, man. Thank you.